Okay, welcome everybody to today's meeting of the CUNY Set Theory Seminar. We are very pleased to have Professor Andreas Blas of the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, who will speak to us for two weeks. And the first week today, the first of his lectures is titled, Do These Ultra Filters Exist? One, Preservation by Forcing. Okay, Andreas, take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to everyone for being here. Um, so officially I was asked to um, give the talks that I gave at the um, Carnegie Mellon seminar a while ago. Uh, since then I've learned a few things. Well, actually during that seminar, I learned a few things from the comments. So this is not gonna be quite the same, but uh, rather similar. So both this week's talk and next week's are about open problems concerning the existence of certain types of ultra filters on the natural numbers. Um, I'll talk this week about ultra filters preserved by certain forcing extensions of the universe. I'll say exactly what that means in a few minutes. Um, next week, I'll talk about something else and then point out similarities and differences between these two notions. I should add that almost all of what I'm going to say is not due to me. I've put in a, a, attributions in some places in the slides, but I've undoubtedly missed a few. So my apologies to the actual discoverers of many of these things. I'm essentially summarizing a lot of information here, summarizing a lot of information next week, and then doing a comparison of the two. Okay, so let me start with, um, do these ultra filters exist? And I guess the first thing I need to do is spell ultra filters correctly. Maybe I'll remember to do that one of these days. Um, a filter, so I'm just gonna go through a bunch of definitions, many of which will be familiar to most of you, but <clears throat> I'd like to have them officially on the record anyway. So a filter on the set of natural numbers <coughs> is a family of subsets closed under finite intersections and supersets. And my filters will always be proper filters, so they don't contain the empty set. Equivalently, they're not the whole power set of omega. Before I go any further, I should add, I'm describing these things as on omega, and at various points in the talk, I will actually want to talk about filters on some other countable sets. Everything I say about the omega case works just as well on other countable sets. Just fix an arbitrary bijection with omega and transfer, transfer my whole talk to omega if necessary. <clears throat> okay, that's filters. Ultra filters can be defined in various ways. The quickest is it's a maximal filter, maximal with respect to inclusion. A somewhat more useful view is that if you partition omega into two pieces, x and its complement, one or the other will be in this ultra filter. Notice they can't both be because of filters being closed under finite intersections and not containing the empty set. Another often useful characterization, ultra filters, uh, filters such that when it contains the union of two sets, it contains one or the other. I need two constructions of new ultra filters from old ones. One is just the image of an ultra filter under a function if u is an ultra filter on omega and f as a function defined on omega, then f of u is an ultra filter on, well, the other omega, the image of f consisting of those sets whose inverse image is in u. Um, very easy to check that that is an ultra filter. The other construction is a bit more complicated. It works like this. I'm going to look at omega squared. You can see, I'm hoping that my highlighting with the cursor shows up for you. 
Um, there's supposed to be sort of a blue marking on that omega squared. Omega squared, I'm gonna view pictorial as omega by omega. If I have an ultrafilter U on the horizontal one, on that copy of omega, and if I have on each vertical slice an ultrafilter on that copy of omega, then I can combine all those ultrafilters into a single ultrafilter on omega squared by this formula, which if you read it, um, it's a non-trivial issue just to check whether the braces match up correctly. Um, figuring out what it actually means is, <laughs> let me just wave my hands at what it means and hope that it agrees with what's on the slide. Um, to tell whether a subset of omega squared, so a subset of the plane, is large, is in the ultra filter being defined, what you do is you look at its intersection with each vertical slice and ask, is that intersection in the ultra filter V sub I associated to that vertical slice? So for each vertical slice, you get an answer, yes or no. And then you ask, are almost all the answers yes? If they're not, they're almost all no, because U is an ultra filter. And if almost all vertical slices have almost all their points in my set, then I call that set large. And again, one can check easily that that is an ultra filter. So we have images of ultra filters, we have sums of ultra filters. Oh, and by the way, I've carried out my promise that I would eventually spell ultra filter correctly. There it is, correctly spelled. Um, Let's hope there aren't too many more mistakes like that. Um, I'll need to talk about a couple of species of special ultra filters. There are quite a few such species, but the ones important for this talk are, first of all, the selective ultra filters. Definition I've given here is that if you have a function f on omega on the set where the ultra filter lives, then either that function is constant on a set in the ultra filter, or it's one to one on a set in the ultra filter. The terminology selective comes from an easily equivalent formulation that says if you partition omega into some collection of pieces, then either one of the pieces is in the ultra filter, or there is a selector, one point per piece that's in the ultra filter. So that's selective. I use this formulation in terms of functions because it makes it very easy to give the definition of a p-point ultra filter. It's word for word the same except for these words. Instead of one to one, it's finite to one. So that says either, again, in terms of partitions, either one block of the partition is in the ultra filter or there's a set in the ultra filter that selects finitely many points per block, as opposed to just selecting one point per block in the previous case. So those are P points. A couple of comments. Yeah, let's see. First of all, selective ultra filters are, among other things, P points. The converse is not in general true, but you can't say very much about implications and so on, because ZFC doesn't even prove that any such ultra filters exist. There might not be any P points. It does follow from the continuum hypothesis. Existence of both types follows from the continuum hypothesis and from weaker assumptions, Martin's axiom is enough uh, there are some cardinal characteristic equalities that imply existence of even the stronger version, selective ultra filters, and so on. So it's consistent that these things exist. It's also consistent that they don't exist. Um, an alternative characterization of P points that turns out to be useful from time to time is Again, let me wave my hands. Instead of thinking of a partition of omega into blocks and saying that either a block is in the 
ultra filter or a set consisting of finitely many points per block is in the ultra filter. Instead of thinking of the individual blocks, think of unions of the blocks. Take the union of all the blocks, all but the first, all but the second, all but the third, and so on. So you have a decreasing sequence of sets. If all those sets are in the ultra filter, which is essentially a way of saying that no single block is in the ultra filter, then there's a set in the ultra filter which is included up to a finite error in each of those shrinking sequence of sets. And this is just viewing the previous definition in terms of these cumulative unions of blocks instead of the individual blocks. Okay, that's, I think all I need to say about ultra filters in general. Now I need to get to the main topic of the talk, um, preserving or destroying violent terminology, killing ultra filters. So suppose I have an ultra filter. To say that it's preserved when I go to a forcing extension, what should it mean? The most obvious thing to try to mean is, well, it's still an ultra filter in the extension. Unfortunately, that is a rather trivial notion. It happens if and only if the forcing extension didn't add any reals. If you add no new subsets of omega, then of course an ultra filter of the ground model is literally an ultra filter of the extension. But as soon as you add a new subset of omega, neither that subset nor its complement can be in an ultra filter from the ground model simply because they're not in the ground model. So preservation to be a reasonable concept should work around that and say, not that all those new sets are literally in the ultra filter or their complements are in the ultra filter, but rather say that those new sets include sets that are in the ultra filter. Another way to say that is you take that ultra filter from the ground model, make a filter out of it by closing it under supersets in the extension, and then ask, is that an ultra filter? This is what I've written here. Preserved means not that it is literally an ultra filter in the extension, but that it's a base for an ultra filter. Base just means when you throw in all the supersets, you get an ultra filter. So another way to say that is each subset of omega in the extension either includes a set in U, in which case it belongs to the ultra filter generated by U, or it's disjoint from a set in U, in which case the complement of that subset belongs to the ultra filter generated by U. In other words, no set in the extension splits all the subsets in U. Either it'll contain something in U, or it'll be disjoint from something in U. It can't just divide each set in U into two parts. So this is what it means to be preserved. And negation of preserved is called killed. Some people will say destroyed. Some people will probably have other names for it. Killed is nice and short. OK, so the general question to ask about this is, what kinds of forcing extensions kill or preserve which kinds of ultra filters? Um, and as I said a moment ago, there's a trivial case. <clears throat> if the forcing extension doesn't add reals, then it trivially preserves all ultra filters. So I'm only going to be interested in forcing extensions that do add reals. Some kinds of new reals destroy all ultra filters in a rather simple way. Namely, they split all infinite ground model sets. Remember that to preserve an ultra filter, you should not split any of the sets in you. 
if you add, for instance, a Cohen real, then given any subs any infinite subset of omega in the ground model, a Cohen generic subset of omega, I need to give these names, fix some subset infinite A subset of omega in the ground model. Now we join a Cohen real subset of omega. That Cohen real will have infinitely many members in A and infinitely many, sorry, will contain infinitely many members of A, but will avoid infinitely many members of A. So it splits A into two infinite pieces. That's a very direct genericity argument. So that Cohen real is going to destroy all ultrafilters on omega. The same goes for random reals. A random real will split every ground model real. Not only split it, it'll split it sort of 50-50 because it's random. So those reals, like Cohen reals and random reals, kill all of the ground models ultrafilters. There are other reals that don't do that. A nice example is a Matthias real. Okay, I guess that's the next sentence. Matthias reals don't literally split the ground model reals because if we take any infinite subset of the ground model and then adjoin a Matthias real, either all but finitely much of that Matthias real is going to be in that infinite subset or all but finitely much is outside that finite sub that infinite subset. So that infinite subset is well, maybe split to a finite plus an infinite piece, but it's not going to be seriously split by the Matthias real, but it is going to be split by some other reals in that extension. A Matthias real easily produces other reals that do split all ground model infinite sets and therefore kill all ground model ultrafilters. And in fact, that's not something special for Matthias reals. It depends only on the fact that it adds a dominating real. Uh, let me spend a moment to give you the hand-waving proof of that. I don't think I have it on the slide, but let me just say what's involved here. So suppose I add to a ground model of set theory some real, some function from omega to omega that eventually dominates each of the ground model functions from omega to omega. An example, for instance, would be the real that enumerates a Matthias generic subset of omega in increasing order. Matthias generic sets are extremely thin. When you enumerate them, you get a very rapidly increasing function. So I have this function f in the extension dominating all ground model reals. In the extension, I can use f to partition omega into intervals, finitely long intervals as follows. Oh, should have said something first. Without loss of generality, f is a monotone non-decreasing function. It dominates all the ground model reals. If you increase each of its values to be non-decreasing, it still dominates. So now take, maybe I don't need that now. But I will later, so it's good to say anyway. Um, partition omega into intervals so that f of zero is still in the first interval. No matter how big it was, first interval is long enough to include it. And then f of the first point in the second interval is still in the second interval. So that may be a big number, make that second interval long enough to include it. And continue that way, chopping up into intervals so that f at the beginning of any interval gives you a value short of the end of the same interval. It stays in the same interval. Now, that's done in the extension, but let's think about any set in the ground model, an infinite set A subset of omega in the ground model. The ground model has a function that sends each natural number n to the next element of A after N. That ground model function is eventually dominated by F. If you think about that in connection with say N being the first point in one of those intervals, the next element of A is still in that same interval. 
since that happens eventually, it means with finitely many exceptions, every one of those intervals contains an element of A. But then if you partition omega into the union of the even numbered intervals on one hand and the union of the odd numbered intervals on the other hand, you have thereby split A because A hits all the intervals. So it has infinitely many points in even and infinitely many points in odd numbered intervals. So that's really all that's involved in the fact that if you add a dominating real, you have killed all ultra filters of the ground model. So that applies to Matthias forcing, it applies to Lever forcing. I'm tempted to say it applies to Heckler forcing, but in fact, Heckler forcing adds Cohen reels. So I didn't need to go through all this dominating stuff for that. So the first point here is simply that there are forcings which simply kill all ground model ultra filters. Well, so the next question is how about the other extreme? Might there be a forcing that preserves all ground model ultra filters? And the answer is no. Let's see, maybe I should put some stuff up here. There's the question. Um, the answer is no, um, but this is a different question. Yeah, my slides are out of order. Okay, no, my slides are in order. My talk is out of order. Is there some way, we've seen Cohen reels, random reels, Matthias, Laver, Heckler, they all destroy all the ground model ultra filters. The forcing preserves the ground model ultra filters Apart from that triviality, if, again, if you don't add reels, of course you preserve everything. But can you preserve an ultrafilter while adding all reels? The answer is consistently yes. I think the first theorem in that direction is due to Baumgartner and Laver. Selective ultrafilters are preserved when you add a Sachs reel. And in fact, you can even add lots of Sachs reels. If you iterate, Sachs forcing with countable support for omega two steps. Selective ultrafilters are preserved. The reason this is only consistently yes is because it's only consistently the case that selective ultrafilters even exist. There are models with no selective ultrafilters, and there this doesn't tell me anything about preservation. More generally, P points are preserved when you add Sachs reels, also when you add Miller reels. Uh, the Miller case here is perhaps worth emphasizing. I had shown a moment ago that if you add a dominating reel, you kill all ultra filters. One might reasonably ask, would it be enough to add an unbounded reel? The answer is no, that result doesn't apply with unbounded reels because a Miller reel is unbounded and nevertheless preserves some ultra filters. And again, you could iterate for countable support, omega two steps, either of those forcings. Um, the result, that last result is in the joint paper of Saharan Shelach and myself, but that result is in fact due to Shelach, not to me. Um, so that's what, so the reference to Shelach is for the result, not for the paper. Um, okay, so on a previous slide, the things that were being preserved were selective ultrafilters and P points. Well, the more general case, P points. What happens there? Well, you can actually say something fairly general about that. If a forcing adjoins a new real, not majorized by a ground model. So we're in the case where we're adding an unbounded real, but to make it interesting, not adding a dominating wheel. Because if we add dominating wheel, no ultra filters are preserved, but let's just add an unbounded wheel, a wheel not eventually majorized by any ground model wheel. For instance, Miller forcing. 
if that preserves an ultrafilter, the ultrafilter has to be a p-point. Now I wonder whether I can, um, oh, let's see, if I do that, do you still see full screen or has that been messed up? I'm afraid I've messed it up. Let me go back to full screen. Um, let's see, there was something in the chat probably answering. Yes, you can see it, okay. So it does stay on full screen. All right, let's see what, if I can get away with that. I have to close the chat. Still okay? Yeah, complain if it isn't. Um, so what I would like to do is a hand-waving argument for that. So I'm looking at a forcing where I've got a new unbounded reel and an ultra filter that's preserved. And I want to show that that's a P point. Actually, I think I can do that. Let me not do anything particularly complicated and just do this as a hand wave. And if it doesn't work as a hand wave, I'll do something else later. Okay. So I'm going to look at a non-P point and show that it cannot be preserved in this situation. A non-P point by definition is an ultra filter on omega such that some function on omega, some function f is neither finite to one nor constant on any set in the ultra filter. I would like to be able to wave my hands at that, but unfortunately if the ultra filters on Omega, all I can do is a lot of this. And it's far from clear even to me what goes on then. So I'm going to arrange the ultra filter in a more pictorial way. I've got ultra filter on Omega and I've got this function F that witnesses that it's not a P point. I'm going to put an isomorphic copy of that ultra filter on omega squared. So again, omega squared is this nice rectangle quadrant of the plane. And I'm going to make the isomorphism such that F is simply the projection down to the vertical axis, projection vertically down to the horizontal axis, the first projection. To say that that F is not constant on any set in the ultra filter is just to say that the ultra filter doesn't contain any single vertical slice. Being an ultra filter, of course, it then will not contain the union of finitely many vertical slices. So it essentially says if I take omega squared and draw a vertical line anywhere, the ultra filter concentrates to the right of that, not to the left. Furthermore, the ultra filter is not finite to one on any set, sorry, the function F, the projection is not finite to one on any set in the ultra filter. That means that if I draw the graph of any function in omega squared, think of it as growing fairly rapidly. The ultra filter cannot concentrate on the set below that graph because on the set below the graph, the projection is finite to one. So the ultra filter has to concentrate above the graph of every function from omega to omega, okay? So this is what's happening in the ground model with this non-P point. Now comes the forcing extension that allegedly preserves this P point, but allegedly adds this new unbounded real. Without loss of generality, the new unbounded real is a monotone function from omega to omega. You can always increase a function to be monotone. Now what happens? Consider the, this new function, this monotone. I'm waving my hands too high to be in the, let's see, there. I'm waving my hands way up here because this is an unbounded function that's up there. Um, what I would like to do is to partition 
the plane where this ultra filter now lives into the part above that graph of the new function and the part below. So this is a partition in the forcing extension. Okay. And I ask, given that partition, since the ultra filter from the ground model is allegedly preserved, there has to be a set in the ultra filter, which is either way up there above this new function or down below. And it can't be down below because if it were down below, the projection would be finite to one on it. So it's up above. It concentrates to set in the ground model that concentrates on the stuff above this new function. I'm tempted, yeah, I will now tell you something that isn't exactly true and then I'll repair it. Take that set in the ground model that's above the new function. In each vertical slice, take the smallest element of that ground model set. That's a ground model function above this new unbounded function. We've just majorized in the ground model, an unmajorizable function of the extension. That would be a contradiction, except that I lied. What did I lie about? I said in each slice, take the lowest element of that ground model set in the ultra filter that's above the new graph. Some slices might not intersect that set in the ultra filter. There might not be an element, lowest or otherwise there. So I'm really only getting a partial function defined on those, at those slices that meet this particular set in the ultra filter. Fortunately, having such a partial function, I can extend it essentially leftward. It's defined at infinitely many places. So if I'm looking at a slice where there's nothing from my set and I don't get a smallest element, go just enough to the right to get to a slice that does have something, take the lowest element there, take the lowest element there and copy it over to the slice that you want. In other words, make things nice and big in the slices where you don't have a value by going to the right and taking a value there. That fixes the lie and gets you some, a function in the ground model that majorizes the allegedly unmajorizable function in the extension. So that's why you, if you adjoin an unmajorizable function, something like Miller forcing, you cannot hope to preserve anything more than p-points. And let me remind you from the previous slide, Miller forcing does preserve p-points. So in the case of Miller forcing, we know exactly what's preserved. The p-points are, and anything else isn't. On the other hand, if you don't add an unmajorizable new function, if you're doing something like Sachs forcing, so the precise assumption is a proper omega to the omega bounding forcing. It tends to preserve sums. More precisely, if it preserves an ultra filter on omega and an ultra filter on each slice, then it preserves the sum as well. I suppose I can try to give a hand wavy argument for that as well. So fix you, fix all the V sub i's in all the slices and consider an arbitrary subset of omega squared. I want to show that it includes or is disjoint from a set from this ground model ultra filter. So what do I do? I look in each, I use the definition of the ultra filter first. I look in each slice separately and ask about my set in the extension, look at that slice of it. 
VI is preserved, so that set will either include or be disjoint from a set in VI. And that happens in every slice. So in every slice, I have a decision, yes or no, whether my set that I'm worrying about is in VI at that slice or not. So I get yes or no decisions along the base. And again, because U is preserved, there's a set in U on which all those decisions are the same. And let me say without loss of generality, suppose they're yes. So I have a set in U. And for each I in that set, I have a set in VI, all in the ground model, that's included in my big set that I'm trying to make a decision about. This looks dangerous. This looks remarkably close to saying that I should be able to make that decision just by saying, well, it's yes, I've got a set in the base, I've got sets in all the slices, but there's a catch. And the catch is why I need all this hypothesis here. The catch is this I do indeed have in each, for each i in a set in u, an appropriate set in v sub i in the ground model. What I don't have is a sequence in the ground model of such sets, one for each i. So in the forcing extension, there is such a sequence. All its terms are in the ground model. They are sets in the corresponding v sub i's, but the sequence itself may not be in the ground model. And this is where proper and omega to the omega bounding come in. Proper says, well, proper implies, among many other things, that if I have in the extension an omega sequence of elements of the ground model, there is a countable set in the ground model that contains them all. It may not be the set of exactly those things, but it contains all of them. And then I can, that's what I get from properness. Then I can use omega to the omega bounding to get that for each i, this countable approximation to what I want contains the, the set that I want from vi and contains just finitely many more sets all in vi. The all in VI is just to intersect with VI, but to get it down to finitely many from countable is precisely where you need omega to the omega bounding. And once you have those finitely many, then you can intersect them all and still be in the ultra filter VI. And that's how you get appropriate sets in the ground model, in this ground model ultra filter to be included in or disjoint from a given set in the extension. And let me emphasize that these two, the two sentences that are now on the slide go in opposite directions because this kind of a sum is never a p-point. Again, the projection to the first coordinate is never constant or one-to-one -one on any set of such an ultra filter. So let's see, special case, Sachs forcing is proper and omega to the omega bounding. And I mentioned on the previous slide, preserves P points. It also therefore preserves sums of P points with respect to P point ultra filters and sums of those and sums of those and so on. So as soon as you've got P points, which remember you don't necessarily, CFC doesn't prove they exist, but if there's a P point, then there are lots of other non-P points that are also preserved by Sachs forcing. Okay. Killing ultra filters. I think this is what I was starting to say earlier, but let me look carefully. Can you add new reels and still preserve all ultra filters? You have to be a little bit careful not to add any unmajorized functions and so on, but might that be possible? The answer is no. 
no matter how you add a reel, some ultra filter, some ultra filter is going to get killed. And that's what this theorem says. Um, this theorem is in a paper of those four authors. I've been told by Goldstone that this particular theorem from that paper is due to Shela. There seems to be a lot of that going around. <laughs> Theorems due to Shela. Um, I think the title of that paper is something like all meager filters may be null, which doesn't sound like it has much to do with this, but this is sort of tacked on. I think it's the last thing in the paper, a construction of an ultra filter killed by reels. The same construction is also in the book of Patrushinsky and Yuda, that theory of the reels. Uh, some time ago, I decided that since I work a lot with ultra filters, I should really learn how the proof of this theorem goes. Um, so I looked it up in the Bartoszynski Yuda book and thought about it for a while and realized that it actually proves more than it says. Um, and what it says is this. What it proves is quantifiers in the other order. Instead of saying for every way of adding reels, there is an ultra filter that's killed. It says there is an ultra filter such that however you add the reels, it gets killed. And in fact, not only is there such an ultra filter, there are lots of them. The formal statement is, oh, I spelled extending about as well as I spelled ultra filter. Oh, well, um, there is an analytic filter on omega. Analytic means with respect to the, topo the usual product topology on the power set of omega, such that all ultra filter extensions of it get killed every time you add reels. Um, and I think I put on the slide here, the point of having an analytic filter like that is that an analytic filter is very, very far from being an ultra filter. Precise statement is that it has, well, one statement is it had many ultra filter extensions. Um, here's a more precise version of that. There is a finite to one function. So essentially you're taking the omega and collapsing some finite sets to points such that the image of the filter under that collapsing is just the cofinite filter, which is really as far as you can get from being ultra. Um, This last part, existence of such a finite to one function is a combinatorial way of saying that this filter has the bare property. Um, and I think this was, I don't think it's stated in the uh, original paper of Bartoszynski and company, but it, it, it's clear. Once I understood the proof, it was clear that I think since all these people understood the proof long before I did, it was clear to all of them, but I don't think anybody bothered to say it. Um, now let's see, proof sketch. I guess I, I've got one slide that's a proof sketch and another slide that's um, trying to fill in a little bit more. Maybe I'll skip the other one, but do this one. I want to describe some ultra filters, in fact, a lot of ultra filters that get killed whenever you add reels. And now I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning of the talk. It's sometimes convenient to deal with filters and ultra filters on sets other than omega. The set that I have in mind here is this B, the free Boolean algebra on countably many generators. Um, the way to think of that is think of the generators as being variables of propositional logic. 
propositional variables, build propositional formulas out of them, that gets you a Boolean algebra, except you have to mod out biological equivalence, equivalent classes of propositional formulas with a fixed set of countably many propositional variables. I'm gonna be talking about ultra filters on the set B. And now let me be very careful here because the English language has these unfortunate, very short prepositions. There's also a notion of an ultra filter in a Boolean algebra, which is not what I want. This, that would be a subset of the Boolean algebra closed under finite meets and going up in the algebra. That's not what I want. I want ultra filters on the set B. So if you like ultra filters in the power set algebra of B. Ultra filter is a family of subsets of B closed under finite intersections and supersets. That's what I have in mind. Okay, so B is essentially playing the role of the omega in most of my previous discussion. It's the set on which ultra filters live. Oh, I also want to identify G with omega. So my propositional variables. This gets done in almost every introductory logic book, right? The propositional variables are something like p sub zero, p sub one, p sub two, and so on. Well, identify p sub n with n. That way, if you have a function from omega to two, a, a real in the usual sense, with this identification, it gives you a truth value, zero or one, for each of your propositional variables. And then you just use truth tables to define from that an assignment of truth values to all of the propositional formulas, all the elements of B. So I'm gonna write V bar for the truth assignment to arbitrary formulas given by the values V for the atomic formulas. Okay, and now here's the key definition in this proof. A set of propositional formulas is small. If there are a lot of truth assignments, a perfect set P of assignments of values to the propositional variables, such that all of those assignments in P and all of the formulas in X agree on a single truth value. They all give the same value. Okay. So that's my definition of small. Well, I shouldn't say my definition. It's Sherlock's definition because this is essentially his proof. Rewritten so that Basically, I took the proof and rewrote it so that I would understand it more easily. There are two claims to be made. Let me say the second one first because it's shorter. The whole set B, the whole Boolean algebra is not the union of finitely many small sets. That's going to say that the small sets generate a proper ideal or the complements generate a filter on the set B. And the other is state claim number one. If I have a set X in the ground model, a set of propositional formulas here in the ground model, and I have a new real such that the truth values that that real thought of as a truth assignment gives to the formulas in X, if those are all the same, all the elements of X get the same truth value under the single assignment R, then X is small. Then there's a whole perfect set in the ground model of assignments that all give all the elements of X that truth value. Okay. Now, if I have those two claims, then I can do the following. First, B is not the union of finitely many small sets. 
there are ultra filters, I should have said ultra filters on B containing no small sets. That's from claim two. And any such ultra filter is killed whenever a new real is added. Why is that? Well, because when it, if a new real is added, only small sets will get the same truth value under that new assignment. So let me say that more carefully. Add a new real R. It assigns in a new way truth values to all the propositional variables. Thereby produces our bar truth values for all the elements of B. So it splits B into two parts. The ones that come out, the formulas that come out true under R, the ones that come out false under R. If the ultra filter contained, if an ultra filter from the ground model contained a set that's entirely in one piece of that partition. In other words, if the ultra filter were preserved, it would have to contain such a set. Call that set X. R is constant on X, but then X would be small and the ultra filter doesn't contain small sets. So any ultra filter that contains no small sets is killed. That immediately gives me the first of the points on the previous slide. There are ultra filters which are killed no matter what new real you get. It doesn't even have to be an enforcing extension. Any new real will do. Uh, any new real that gives you a model of ZFC. Furthermore, a little quantifier counting says that the family of small sets is analytic. So the filter generated by the complements of small sets is analytic. And any extension of that filter contains no small sets and is therefore always killed. Okay, I think I will, in the interest of time, skip claim one and claim two and talk a bit about preservable ultra. So, so far we've got this example of always killed ultra filters. By the way, there are other examples of analytic ideals, all of whose ultra filter extensions are killed by all forcings. Um, let's see, I didn't put this on the slides, but there's a paper of Kordonsky, Guzman, and Hushak, where, among other things, they show that the uh, density ideal, the set of subsets of omega, to back up, if you look at subsets of omega with asymptotic density one, that is, go out to some large n, count how many elements are in the subset divided by n, total number of elements. If that approaches one, put that set in the filter. The filter of sets that have asymptotic density one in that sense has the property that all ultra filter extensions of it are always killed. So there are apparently lots of such ideals um, the one I gave here is just the one that comes automatically when you look carefully at the standard proof that some ultra filters get killed. Okay, so what kinds of ultra filters can be preserved? What does it mean to be preserved by some forcing? The broadest class we've seen so far is P points and sums produced from P points. Those are all preserved by Sachs forcing. What might be preserved by some other forcings? What else might be preserved by Sachs forcing? And so forth. 
Well, there's a nice theorem due to Arnie Miller that, said, that characterizes what kinds of ultrafilters can be preserved. It says the following are equivalent. Number one is the property that I'm interested in. There's a forcing that adds new reels and preserves this ultrafilm. Number two, Sachs forcing preserves you. In other words, it won't do any good to look at forcings other than Sachs if you're looking for preserving more ultrafilters. If an ultrafilter is preserved by some forcing, it's preserved by Sachs forcing. And three, the part that makes this result especially interesting to me is a formulation that doesn't directly talk about forcing at all or about preservation. It says that if I take a perfect subset of the reals, the power set of omega, I can always shrink it to a perfect subset, all of whose members are decided by a single A in U. What does it mean for a real to be decided by A? It means that that A in U either is a subset of that real, of that other real, and therefore it tells you that that real is in U, or A is a subset of the complement of that real, and therefore tells you that that real is not in U. In other words, given any real in this perfect subset, whether it's in you or out of you, all comes from, the, from one and the same A in you. There are various ways to improve or to apparently improve this statement. They don't really tell you any more, but they look nicer. For example, the way it's stated here, you get this perfect subset, this perfect subset, which may have some elements in you and therefore contain A, and other elements out of you and therefore disjoint from A. You can arrange that only one of those happens just by cutting down, take in your perfect subset, partition it into those that contain A and those that are disjoint from A, those are both closed and one of them will have a perfect subset. So you can assume it's the same decision all the time. You've got a perfect subset, such that the intersection of all its members is in A. That's what it means for them all to be positively decided by A. They're all in you because they all include A. Perfect subset has a smaller perfect subset such that either the intersection of all those reals is in you, well, these reals are all in you, and so is their intersection, which is quite remarkable because it's a lot of things you're intersecting, or a perfect subset, none of whose members are in you, and even their union isn't in you. Another reformulation that will be useful next time, instead of saying every perfect subset has a further perfect subset, we can just say has an uncountable subset. Uh, the point is that starting with a perfect subset, for any single A, the things that include it, or in the other case, the things that are disjoint from it, form a closed set. And if you have an uncountable closed set, that will include a perfect subset. So instead of, you can apparently weaken this perfect subset in part three to just say an uncountable subset, but it still comes to the same thing. Um, let's see. An ultrafilter has a basis of size less than C, then it's preserved. I guess that follows from this equivalent form because this perfect subset 
as cardinality of the continuum. If there's a single A in U that's included in them all, uh, that's included in un little, that's included in uncountably many, then the theorem tells us that that ultra filter is preserved. If for each A in U, it's in only countably many, then this whole perfect subset has at most countably many times the size of this base for the ultra filter. If that base is less than C, you're not going to get a perfect subset that way. You won't get a set of cardinality continuum that way. So an ultra filter with a small basis is necessarily preserved by Sachs forcing. If the ultra filter has a really small basis, like less than the dominating number, then by a theorem of Kettinen, it's a p-point and preserved by earlier results. But this says any basis less than C, it's going to be preserved. Um, okay. I'm now on slide 12 out of 11, it says at the bottom of this thing. That may need some correcting too. I, I have some slides here that give Miller's proof. Um, let me skip that because I, I do want to stop in reasonable time because there is another talk, I think at two o'clock. Um, so let me just summarize the collection of preservable ultra filters. So what kinds of ultra filters can be preserved by some forcing that adds new reals, or equivalently, are preserved by Sachs forcing. Collection of preservable ultra filters has a bunch of properties. First of all, it contains all p points. P points are preserved by Sachs forcing and also by various other things like Miller forcing and iterations thereof. So, contains all p points. Contains all ultra filters generated by a small number of sets, smaller than continuum. Is closed under summation. This is because sex forcing is proper and omega to the omega bounding. So the theorem of sums of preserved ultra filters being preserved applies to sex. Um, looks very nice. Missing one particularly important issue, coming back to the very beginning of the talk, is this collection of preservable ultra filters non-empty? Because there are models, Shannach has constructed a model with no P points. There are models in which no ultra filter is generated by fewer than C sets. I haven't actually checked, but I believe that Shedoff's methods will give you both of those simultaneously so that neither of the first two bullet points actually gives you any ultra filters that are preserved. And of course, if you don't have anything to start with, then closing under summation uh, produces even more nothing. So for all I know, it's entirely possible that in some models of ZFC, there are simply no preservable ultra filters. And I think that is a reasonable place to stop. Next time I'll talk about, about more stuff I don't know. <laughs> For all I know, those things don't exist either. Okay, so I'll quit there. Thank you. So let's thank Andreas for his really interesting talk. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you. Now. I have the historical kind of question. 
Okay. To get things going. Um, yeah. In the late 60s, Grigoriev had a paper, Combinatorics on Ideals or Filters and Forcing. Um, I know it connected various altered filters, like selective filters, maybe, and silver forcing. But does that work uh, come up in this at all? It hasn't yet, but maybe it would if I paid more attention. <laughs> so... So I don't know. I, I've, I've read that paper. I don't remember it as being directly connected to this, but um, there are lots of things that I've read and don't remember, especially if it's sort of a, a side topic. Like, well, the um, Bartoszynski at our paper that I cited that has a proof at the end relevant to this topic, but the title and the abstract don't tell you that. Um, there may be something similar in the Grigoriev paper. Um, my recollection is that it was essentially characterizations of selectivity that were the main issue there. But there may very well have been things that touch this. Um, that's a relatively recent paper. It's under 60 years old. Well, I will follow my, <laughs> I think I will follow Kirach in this. He has, he, he provided the world with a good excuse, namely, I'm not responsible for anything that happened before my PhD. <laughs> my PhD was only 52 years ago. Oh. So, so I'm off the hook for Gregorio, for that paper of Gregorio. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I'm not off the hook for a lot of other papers. <laughs> Okay. Are there any other questions? Let's see, maybe I can stop sharing and get a normal view of the world here. So if there are no other questions, let's thank Andreas again for his excellent talk. We are really looking forward to next week's lecture. So thank you, Andreas. Thank you. And, and now let me ask a technical question. Can I just leave this Zoom link open until Yoko starts talking or is the things gonna shut down and we need to reconnect? Um, it will stay open. Um, nothing much will be happening, and I'm about to stop okay. recording now. That's fine. I just okay. Well, if I don't touch my computer, nothing bad will happen. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you.